A reading from the second book of Samuel. An informant came to David with the report. The children of Israel have transferred their loyalty to Absalom. At this, David said to all his servants who were with him in Jerusalem, Up, let us take flight, or none of us will escape from Absalom. Leave quickly, lest he hurry and overtake us. Then visit disaster upon us and put the city to the sword. As David went up the Mount of Olives, he, was with, he wept without ceasing. His head was covered, and he was walking barefoot. All those who were with him also had their heads covered and were weeping as they went. As David was approaching Bahurim, a man named Shimei, the son of Gera, of the same clan as Saul's family, was coming out of the place, cursing as he came. He threw stones at David and at all the king's officers, even though all the soldiers, including the royal guard, were on David's right and on his left. Shimei was saying as he cursed, Away, away, you murderous and wicked, wicked man. The Lord has requited you for all the bloodshed in the family of Saul, in whose stead you became king. And the Lord has given over the kingdom to your son Absalom. And now you suffer ruin because you are a murderer. Abishai, son of Zeruiah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord and the king? Let me go over, please, and lop off his head. But the king replied, What business is it of mine or yours, son of Zeruiah, that he curses? Suppose the Lord has told him to curse David. Who then will dare to say, Why are you doing this? Then the king said to Abishai and to all his servants, If my own son, who came forth from my loins, is seeking my life, how much more might this Benjamite do so? Let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. Perhaps the Lord will look upon my affliction and make it up to me with benefits for the curses he is uttering this day. David and his men continued on the road while Shimei kept abreast of them on the hillside, all the while cursing and throwing stones and dirt as he went. Fair boom domini. Lord, rise up and save me. O Lord, how many are my adversaries. Many rise up against me. Many are saying of me, there is no salvation for him in God. Lord, rise up and save me. But you, O Lord, are my shield. My glory, you lift up my head. When I call out to the Lord, he answers me from his holy mountain. Lord, rise up and save me. When I lie down and sleep, I wake again, for the Lord sustains me. I fear not the myriads of people arrayed against me on every side. Lord, Lord rise up and save me. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Morticum. 
Jesus and his disciples came to the other side of the sea, to the territory of the Gerasenes. When he got out of the boat, at once a man from the tombs who had an unclean spirit met him. The man had been dwelling among the tombs, and no one could restrain him any longer, even with a chain. In fact, he had frequently been bound with shackles and chains, but the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles smashed and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the hillsides, he was always crying out and bruising himself with stones. Catching sight of Jesus from a distance, he ran up and prostrated himself before him, crying out in a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. He had been saying to him, unclean spirit, come out of the man. He asked him, what is your name? He replied, legion is my name. There are many of us. And he pleaded earnestly with him not to drive him away from that territory. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there on the hillside and they pleaded with him, send us into the swine, let us enter them. And he let them, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine. The herd of about 2,000 rushed down a steep bank into the sea where they had, were drowned. The swine herds ran away and reported the incident in the town and throughout the countryside. And people came out to see what had happened. As they approached Jesus, they caught sight of the man who had been possessed by legion, sitting there clothed and in his right mind and they were seized with fear. Those who witnessed the incident explained to them what had happened to the possessed man and to the swine. Then they began to beg him to leave their district. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed pleaded to remain with him. But Jesus would not permit him, but told him instead, go home to your family and announce to them all that the Lord in his pity has done for you. Then the man went off and began to proclaim in the Decapolis what Jesus had done for him, and all were amazed. Verbum Domini. Today, in the first reading from the second book of Samuel, we have uh, the continuing account that we've been reading of David and his fall from grace, his sin with Bathsheba and the results of that. We remember Nathan the prophet went to David and told him the story after David had sinned with Bathsheba and killed Uriah the Hittite. Told him the story of a rich man taking a poor man's lamb, the only lamb that the poor man had. And it was, a, I guess you'd say, an allegory to what David had done to Uriah the Hittite, took his wife and then uh, arranged for him to be killed in battle. And, uh, you know, David is incensed, you know, who is this man? And Nathan tells him, you are the man, you're the one. And David is convicted. He sinned out of weakness. You know, we're told that he wasn't with the troops. He was at home in Jerusalem. His, his troops were out uh, in battle. And he was, we're told, sitting on the couch. You know, he goes to the porch and sees Bathsheba, a beautiful woman, bathing. And he, he, he sleeps with her. A sin of impurity, a sin of weakness, a sin of concupiscence. And today we see... Uh, David's humility and his willingness to repent. And Nathan tells him, you know, your punishment will be that the sword shall never depart from your house, that I will, the Lord will raise up evil against him out of his own home. He says, for you did, you know, you sinned secretly, but the Lord tells him, I will do the thing, I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David admits his fault. That's the the greatness of David, he says, 
I have sinned against the Lord, recognizing the evil he has done and repents of it. Nathan tells him, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. So God is merciful to him. The child does die. David fasts uh, for the child on the seventh day. The child dies, uh, but he fasted that the Lord uh, may be gracious to him. And when the child dies, he, raises, he rises from his, his, his bed of fasting. And then later he takes Bathsheba to be his wife, and she gives birth to Solomon, who would be a, a great, a wise king. Now, the king's heart, we're told, goes out uh, to Absalom, his son. Absalom is not, uh, is not a son of Bathsheba, but he is the one through whom this violence to his household will come. And Absalom was avenging the rape of his sister um, and killed his half-brother, and then later would re lead this rebellion among David's servants and peoples that he would gather a, an army uh, to cause a civil war. And we're told rather poignantly that Absalom stole the hearts of, of men, and he led this rebellion. He was a charismatic person, we're told, is very handsome, had this great big head of hair that he would cut once a year, <laughs> but would lead to his death, you know, his vanity. He get tangled up in the oak tree in, in battle, and later he was killed. Pope Francis had a great meditation on this story, this scene that we have today a couple years ago. We see in today's account that David, you know, he's accepting this penance, this violence that comes out of his own home. He's fleeing the city. And Pope Francis, in a homily, he meditated that, and we're told in the scriptures that, you know, he, David, uh, considered staying in Jerusalem, that he could fight from that position of strength in, in this civil war, we could say, but that Ju Jerusalem would be destroyed. He wanted to preserve Jerusalem. That David could have taken his, his, you know, his sin and the penance he had to do and kind of bury that with the people, you know, and, and suffer, make the people suffer because of him. But he, he leaves the city. He considers taking the ark as he leaves the city, but changes his mind and sends the ark back to Jerusalem. So to defend himself, he could have surrounded himself with his own people. He could have surrounded himself by the power of God, by keeping the ark with him. Uh, but he has a love for both, a sincere love for both the people and God. And he embraces his penance. And that's the greatness of David. He embraces his penance. He recognizes his sin, his wrongfulness, what he's done wrong, and embraces his penance. And today, we have this image. As he leaves Jerusalem, there's a, a valley on the side of the city wall uh, with a stream in it. They call it the Kidron Valley. And he goes down that and goes up the mount, uh, which is the Mount of Olives. You know, that's the path Jesus takes, embracing the cross and suffering for us all. But Jesus, of course, is innocent and pure. David's guilty, but he's still a Christ figure in the sense that he's embracing this cross, this suffering, that he's not going to use uh, God or the people you know, to protect himself. He embraces the penance. He's barefoot with head covered, going up this rocky mountain barefoot. Now. And that's not enough. We have a third element here with Shemi, who we're told is a, a Benjamite, Benjaminite, and he is, you know, they were one of the tribes of Israel. They were a smaller tribe, but they were known to be warlike and very aggressive, and they live up to this name today. He's cursing David, throwing stones at him, throwing dirt at him, we're told. You know, this hatred, this vehement that he's just unleashing against David, you know, on the, on the ridge, you know, next to David, cursing him as he goes. And David allows it. He says, the Lord has told him to, maybe the Lord will make it up for me with benefits for the curses he is uttering this day. And Pope Francis praises David for that, that he depends on God. He's going to rely on God uh, to be gracious. He's going to trust in God to be gracious to him, to forgive his sins, and to raise him up. And we're, you know, we know in James 
chapter 4, 6, we're told that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And this is what David knows in his heart, that if he embraces this penance, if he depends on God in humility, God in his goodness will raise him up and restore him. David fully acknowledges that he is a sinner, his status as a creature of God. And this results from his his confrontation with a personal God in prayer. You know, David, we're told, is a king after God's heart. And people interpret that to mean that he never falls into false idolatry. He falls into human sin and weakness, but he never goes after the false gods. That he has this love for the Lord combined with this human frailty that we all experience and through his life of prayer, he confronts this personal God and it results in this humility that he recognizes his weakness, who he is. This is contrasted with the spirit of the day, of our age, where we embrace a vague spirituality, we embrace a kind of deism or pantheism. We don't like to recognize that there's this huge difference, this infinite difference between God and man, between God and his creatures. We like to imagine we're, you know, quote unquote, stuff of the absolute. There's not that big a difference, that there's this, uh, we share in the glory of God in some way. Now that's true in the sense of by God's grace, that he calls us to himself, he calls us to communion with him, that that glory can be shared with us, but modernity's view is that we have it by nature or by right, failing to recognize that not a difference in degree, but a difference in kind, an infinite difference between God and man. Yes, we're made in his image, but we're completely contingent. We completely rely, depend on him for our existence, for our holiness, our growth in holiness, our transformation is by God's grace. It's not, you know, solely by our efforts. That we can't achieve that of our own. And we're, as a modern, a modern man is uncomfortable with that. We're uncomfortable with recognizing that we completely receive our being from God. Dietrich von Hildebrand, the great theologian, he says that the humble man does not want to be anything by his own resources. He is free from all ambition to be something by his own power and to have to recognize no master over himself. He wills to receive everything from God alone. The glory of God makes him happy. To praise God, to have reverence for God, to fall down in adoration of God gives the humble man pleasure and we see that uh, exemplified in David in a preeminent way. That's contrary to the spirit of our age. We want to have our security and our achievements. We want to be somebody, do something, and say that I did it, instead of in faith and in humility, relying on God and allowing him to raise us up, to be good to us, to be gracious to us.